I hope you can see this okay. The, the lighting, the projector is not quite bright enough, doesn't have enough punch to it. But anyways, I think you'll be able to see the, the points that we're making here. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to have a little seminar, and I do hope you come back. And what I'm really hoping is that you will be inspired to bring someone else next week. Now, if you're inspired to bring somebody else next week, what would have had to happen? Pardon? Yeah, exactly. So, so what I do when it, when it looks like, and I can see you guys, so I can see when you're nodding off and everything. So when, you, when I see that, I usually start doing a little dance just to get your attention again. So I, I do know a few tricks that I can get you up. And that helps you to enjoy the time. So we'll, we'll figure out how we're going to make you enjoy the time. But in all seriousness, uh, we, oh yeah, oh yeah. We are, um, I believe that we are in the last hours of this age's, this age of history. And my whole point, you can see the first slide here, it says, a Bible prep, uh, prophecy seminar unlike any other. Well, that's a really nice ring, isn't it? Well, I'm going to try and demonstrate, this is, this is my point, is I'm going to try and demonstrate this is a prophecy seminar like none other. It's going to be completely different. And, um, and so we're going to take you through. Uh, before we get into the word, though, I want to just bow our heads and ask for some guidance here for all of us. Father in heaven, we come before you today seeking your ways and your will. Not only your will as far as knowledge and, and what you want us to do, but we need information that we will be able to order our lives to come into a closer walk with you. And today, Father, we ask that you give us the grace we need. We pray for your spirit. And we thank you most of all for your son who took our place and died the death that we deserved, that we could have the life that he deserved. And Father, as we search your word today, as we look at your word and ponder what you have had written, we ask that you impress us of the truths that will apply to each of us. We pray this in the name of our Messiah and coming King. Amen. All right. So, so what I'm going to, what we're looking at here is a prophecy seminar on primarily Daniel and Revelation. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to go elsewhere, but they'll be the focus. And as we go through, it's going to be quite evident uh, that why we're focusing uh, primarily on these two books. So that's, that's where we're going to be heading. And uh, before we get too far, I just want to say uh, a couple of things that we are trying to tape these meetings and so that means if somebody's upset about what I'm saying, we're just going to ask you to just not jump up and start yelling and stuff like that. Um, but but it, actually what I want you to do is we want to tape it so that we have less uh, sort of breakup in, in the filming. So that means if you have a question, if you have a piece of paper, just write it down. I don't know if you're like me, but I got about five minutes up here. If I don't write it down right away, it's gone. So if you got a question, write it down, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions because I think you're going to have some uh, questions. And then what we can do after, if we have time, I'm going to try and get to where we've got about 10 minutes left. And if I can just take a few questions, if there is any. Um, and if there aren't any, that's just fine too. That means you understood perfectly what I've said. So that, that's good, sign of a, a good job. So we're going to do that. Uh, so we'll have that question. We also have a question box at the front uh, out by the table there. If you have any questions you didn't want to ask, because I'm, I'm well aware some people don't want to ask those questions uh, because we're going to look stupid. Well, I'll tell you what. If you have a question that's coming to your mind, somebody else is going to too. So you don't need to... I always say that any question is valid uh, and we want to entertain what the idea or what the answer could be. So, But if you want to just write it down, put it in the box and then the following night, what we're going to do is we're going to 
we'll start with that, those questions. Some of the questions will be answered in, in, during the, the presentation and stuff, so we'll take those up as we go, and I'll just, I'll just say that. We're going to cover that in a bit. So that's, that's the other thing, and, and I'm, I think that's, that's really all the house rules. Everyone know where the washroom is? Two washrooms, men's and ladies out there, and so on. Okay, so we are going to, um, we're going to look at this. Now, what I did actually on my slide presentation, and I came here and it didn't quite work, um, the why shall understand. Does anyone know who spoke those words? Daniel spoke them? Let's have another guess. <laughs> yeah, that's reasonable, isn't it? That's actually found in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. It says, the wise shall understand. But those words should actually be in red. That's Yeshua, the Messiah that spoke these words. And most people don't really, I, I guess they just don't stop and think about it long enough is Yeshua was very familiar with the book of Daniel. And the reason is, is because he was all the way through the book of Daniel. He shows up in chapter 2, he shows up in chapter uh, 3, he shows up in chapter 4 and 5 and 6, and all the way through the rest of the prophecies. Most people don't understand that. So we're going to get into where Yeshua actually quotes Daniel in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason why he was quoting that is because he was very familiar with that. Now, I don't believe that he had a foreknowledge of, you know, who he was when he was giving that. But he knew those were important and he saw himself in those books. And so he spoke of them when the question was asked, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? That was the question that he was asked. And then he takes them through a sequence of events. And then he says, when you see what was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So number one, he qualifies Daniel as a prophet. And he refers to him in the question that was asked. Now, what is the question that was asked? What time is it regarding? Come on, let's... The end of the age, right? And did that end of that age come when he was referring to that? that this is near the end of his life here and, and so this was right at the end, just before his sacrifice, and he was asked, you know, is this the time you're going to set up your kingdom? All these questions. And, and then he starts telling them the signs that we would have at that. And we're going to see in these signs that we are right on the threshold, and that's, that's just it. I don't want to know necessarily when he's coming. I want to know the wrapping up to the coming. And we're going to look at the disciples' questions, and that's exactly what they were looking at. Now, just a little bit about me. I just want to tell you where I'm from. I'm from Canada. Uh, we have a little camp up in Canada just across the Washington state boarding border on the west coast. And it's in the mountains. And what we're trying to do there is we're having, we call it a, a city of refuge. And um, also called an ark, a place of safety. And so that's what we're working on up there. And I have a a little map just so you can see where it is just across the border and it's, it's kind of bumping up against the Canadian Rockies of course Rockies down in in Colorado and so on and that's where we are so that's it's not really that far I think it's about a 30 hour drive and you can be up there and visit us so and this is uh, you can see it's all wilderness around us so this is the camp and uh, so we're right in the middle of here a place, uh, doing a place of refuge. We've got about 15 uh, dwellings up there. We have four families living up there, and we're trying to build this place up as a place for where people can come when things get a little difficult. You do believe things are going to get difficult. And if you don't think that way, just watch the news for a little while, and you'll see that none of this, what they're doing, is sustainable. Either side of the fence you want to be on, none of it's sustainable. So here we have uh, where the camp is. And we had a fellow come up and uh, draw the picture. He sat up on the hill um, and he drew the picture of the camp. So just to give you an idea what we're doing out there in the wilderness. They've got about three and a half feet of snow up there. So it's, uh, unless you like snow, it's not the place to be now. But there is lots of things once you get the snow uh, going. 
This is a little summer picture. One of the families um, were trying to put gardens in and stuff. And they're using a back to Eden garden method. Does everyone know what that is? Yeah, if you've tried that, works well. The one thing you don't want to do is till the wood chips or you're covering into the ground. They're a covering. That's it. Anyways, works wonderful. I was definitely a believer when I saw it uh, work. So they're making it really nice up there. This is one of the families live up there. Another family. Th these are the ones that have the garden. And this next picture, I'm a little bit biased, but this is the best family that I know of. Uh, this is my two grandkids and my daughter and my son-in-law. And uh, so they live up there too. So we've got, when Judy and I are up there, we've got four families living up there. And we're doing community living. And we're trying to live by our Father's principles. The idea when Yeshua said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're just trying to live that out at the camp. And in, at sometimes it's a little harder than it might seem. Uh, Matthew 18. Is anyone familiar with that? Yeah, if you're just living out here in the city, you can ignore your neighbor, right? But when you're living in community with believers, you can't ignore your neighbor. Um, sometimes you've got to work things out. And everything that makes this possible, what we're doing, is an understanding of the time that we're living in. This, to me is really the motivating, motivating force behind everything I'm doing. I probably wouldn't be down here talking and giving you this seminar if I didn't believe that we're in the time that I'm claiming that we're in. And it's time that people actually started getting serious about two things. They need to get serious about their spiritual walk, which we're all, I'm sure, that's why you're here. But we also need to get serious about our physical well-being. What's it going to be like? You guys are familiar with the thing that's going on with the coronavirus? Yeah. You're aware that they're building, building brand new hospitals in China just to deal with this. But they don't think they're going to be on slate for another year or so before they can actually work these things properly. So what's going to happen between now and then? You know, where are the people going? I don't know about you, but in Canada, if there's, if there's an emergency room and they've got like 10 patients in there, they basically lock the doors and you're, you might be 6, 7, 24 hours before you actually can see a doctor. What happens when they have major uh, catastrophes? It's, it's not going to be safe anymore and uh, so we're going to have to do some preparation so that we're not so dependent on the system. Tells us um, the words of our Master tells us that as in the days of Noah, and we sort of think of that's talking about wickedness and so on, but it's actually more than that. Hebrews gives us a little bit of more insight. It says, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now we read that, and we read it, and we read it, but I it all of a sudden hit me what it was actually saying is that Noah was warned of something that had never happened before. And what did he do? He went to work to prepare for that time. Now, I think he could have been just lifted up from the earth and, you know, there could have been just a washing of the earth, the wicked being destroyed, he sets them back down. But it wasn't like that at all. He had to build an ark and then it tells us that he actually had to gather the food to be put into the ark. So could it be like the days in, of Noah be more than just wickedness? Could it be that we've been warned about these things that are coming so that we can prepare? And it may be our truth for this generation as it was for Noah's generation. So my whole point here is I will not consider this successful on my part unless people go away from here motivated that they need to get their spiritual life in order, which I, I know I'm speaking to the choir here. But if you're like me, I know I can always do better in my spiritual walk. Sometimes you fall and so on. We need to get closer to our Savior and Lord. 
And so there's always that to do. And that's the primary focus. The other thing is our physical preparation. And, and I say this, I say this kind of reverently, but seriously, when Yeshua comes back, he's not looking for land deeds and bank accounts. Does that make sense? So the reason why he wants us, and we're going to show some verses where he wants us to know when the time is near, because all these things that sort of hold us down are going to be issues that will take us down. And he wants us to use what we have for whose glory? his glory and he's told us that we have a work to do go into all the world and teach all nations baptizing them and so on and i will be with you unto the end of the age so often you hear the quotation i will be with you unto the end of the age but there is a condition to that there is a condition and that is if we do our work he will be with us the work that he asked us to do so we need to as uh Yeshua was, he was about his father's business. So this is, um, right off the get-go, we need to have some ground rules. Everyone likes ground rules. I see there's probably some married couples in here. Do you guys have some ground rules? Yeah, husband takes out the garbage, wife does the cooking. Those are ground rules, and if we live by that, we'll get along just fine. So we need ground rules, and so in this ground, uh, one of the ground rules that we're going to use, and I'm, I'm hoping that this is okay, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, okay? So while I'm going to throw in some words, this is primarily a seminar that you're going to hear his word. And you're going to get that, because so often, and I'm not going to throw stones, I'm not going to name names, but I've stood in front of too many people that give me two texts, and they talk for two hours. Have you ever been there? And you think, was that their opinion, or where did they even get this? So we want to do that here. We're going to, we're going to rely heavily on his word. Yeshua tells us, and, and I was going to say this, I wanted to put these in red letters because people are just missing the point of the red letters. So, so important. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me. Now, we always think of what this is about, but do we really get it? They were studying the word, just like we all do. And so often we get in our little groups and the guy that's closest to the throne has the most information. Have you ever sat with a group of people like that? You probably haven't. But I, I've sat in rooms where it comes down to the person with the more information is the winner. It's kind of like the guy with the most toys is the winner at the end of life. So the guy with the most Bible information, he's obviously closest to the throne. But Yeshua played, with, played this game and he called them out on it. He says, you guys think you have salvation because you know so much. But the point of the words were to point them to him. And they missed that. And this is something, because history repeats itself, this is a trap that we can fall into. You know, so often we forget that. We think we learn these things, but so often we forget. The enemy of souls is very, very good at what he does, is because he knows the common human pitfalls. And he just focuses on them. Because our memories really only go back about one generation, we forget. There's still people, actually, that don't think the Holocaust happened. You're aware of that, right? And that's because it's just, what, a generation removed? And people are questioning it. And so he's got all this history to play with. So if we can learn some of these things, it'll help us. So these scriptures that we have here today that we're going to be looking at are really to point to him and what he was doing. Primarily, this is a, a prophetic um, event where we're going to be looking primarily at prophecy. We're going to cover other things because you can't cover prophecy without certain other things. But primarily, we're going to be looking at the future. You know, and there's a reason for that because our Father has put a desire in us to know what the future holds for us. Would anyone here like to know what the future holds for them? 
Well, we can know what the overall plan is, what his plan is, and then we can order our lives and actually we're part of our destiny. Our decisions are going to form a part of our destiny. Naturally, we want to get into his plan, but it's kind of like you want to get into that car. And so what we want to do is get into his car, and then we can actually make some decisions that are going to be lasting. But so many people, when it comes to prophecy, this is what they do. Now, we want to look at a couple reasons why they do this, because this is extremely important that we understand this. In past, the people have dealt with prophecy, and I'm not sure, and we won't mention names again, but there's been people that have predicted the end of the world, like 1987 and so on. You've, you've heard of guys like that. Well, there was so much fallout from that. People were losing their jobs, they're making these predictions, and now you can't count on your pastor, and I'm not going to listen to him anymore. So what happened, long and short of it, what happened was the pastors decided... Let's not deal with prophecy anymore. Let's just, I had one guy tell me, you know, he started talking to his pastor about the book of Revelation. He says, well, it's kind of good literature. It's actually the revelation of the Son of God to us. Good literature? Yeah, it's probably some of the best. But he was just putting it off. And so they, they stay away from it. And so what's happened is people have shied away from prophecy because they've been burned. They've been burned from their pastors. They've shared things that their pastors have shared. It's not come to pass. Their families are mad at them. They're not going to listen to a word they say anymore. So the safety thing is just to withdraw from something that hurts, that hurts you. And prophecy has hurt us because it's been so misapplied. And there's reasons for that, which we're going to get into. But there are good reasons why people, they don't want any part of it. But I don't know about you, when we hide our heads in the sand, we put ourselves in a very vulnerable position. And we don't want to get our butts kicked. But that's exactly what's going to happen unless we take our uh, eyes out of the sand and start hitting this stuff head on. And a lot of people, you know, they have these rose-colored glasses on that they just see the world from their ideas, from their ideologies that they have in their mind and everything's fine and they're like they're in heaven, they're in the kingdom right now and don't bother me with this stuff because, you know, I get a little bit nervous and, and this on. The prophecies are actually a love gift. It's called the gift of prophecy. So our Father knows how to give good big gifts that's what we're told, and it was one of his gifts. So if we're thinking that the prophecies are scary, we're looking at them incorrectly. That's just a fact. So we've got to come to grips with that and see how our Father is looking at this gift. And once we start to do that, uh, things work a little bit better. Now here's another reason why people are scared of getting outside of their realm of what they think is reality because they feel safe and secure in their box. Have you guys ever felt like that? We're going to try through this series, I'm going to try and rip the sides off of this box for you so that you can get out and you can actually live and move. Because when we get inside these boxes and we won't think outside the boxes, we are trapped. You know, the Lord God Almighty of the universe doesn't live in boxes. And so if we're created in his image, we've got to get out of a box and, and fit into his, his realm of thinking. And it's, it's far beyond our ideas. Ephesians tells us then he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Yeshua. So here we go, the purpose, and, and there's five, and people say, well, there's five other ones, yeah. There are five other ones, but who out here, who would be confident, and don't raise your hand, this is a question, I don't want to see any hands, but who would be confident that they know someone that they could say they're a prophet? Yeah. Okay. So we're told that these gifts are put in the church for what? Edification. Edification for the building up of the body. Now, 
well, I can, I can name some people that claim to be apostles or claim to be evangelists or pastors or teachers. But herein lies the problem. It's easy to claim those roles. Prophecy is completely different. Because prophecy involves telling the future and being right about it. So I have a question, a serious question that we all should be asking each other. If we don't know too many prophets, they're far and wide between, I started wondering, do we actually have real apostles? Do we actually have real evangelists? Do we actually have real pastors and real teachers? Because if we don't have prophets, we don't have these either. Are you with me? Is we have people, and I'm, I'm bringing myself into this realm now, we have people that are teaching. Yeah, they're teaching, but are they really teaching? Are they really doing these things? I, what I'm trying to do here is I'm, I'm trying to get you to not rely on things you're being told, and that includes me too. Now, people say, well, I don't really have time to come to a seminar. You know, I don't want to sit here for an hour and a half. This is your eternal life. Have you thought about that? Have you got more than a five-minute video on YouTube to put into this? We're, we're being asked by this creator. And I say, do you really know who he is? We have no clue who this, this creator is. The best we can tell is he came in the flesh, he lived among men, and they killed him in very short time. Didn't even get to live out his life. We don't know who this guy is. We only know him in the person of Yeshua. And we know that God is love, but we don't understand the vastness, the greatness of this thing. And so what he wants us to do is do the work for him so that we can be joined up back in with Ephesians. It tells us that he has a family in heaven that he wants to reunite with his family on earth because it's been broken. Now he's asked us if we want to be part of this Universal gathering, we can see this in the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, this universal gathering with all the heavenly universe, and we are there. And he's asked us to be a part of that for eternity. A life in a kingdom that's so far beyond our wildest imagination. Paul says, not eye, nor ear, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that our Father has prepared. Now you just want to let that rattle around in your brain for a little while. And when I talk to people that don't have an hour or two hours to give up to find out about this, to find out to make sure their salvation is secure, they have no idea what they're saying no to. And it's just, to me, it's just so scary. It says, till we all come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Yeshua. Now the plan is, is to restore his image back in man. Is anyone there yet? You can raise your hand in this one. <coughs> anyone there yet? No, we're not there yet. So this, this thing that he's done, these gifts in the church, is to, to make this happen. That's why. That's why we're supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen. Now it goes on in Acts chapter 2, and we're talking about prophecy. It says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, I believe, we're living in those days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. It says all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And in those days I will pour out my spirit upon my men servants and upon my maid servants and they shall prophesy. This is the gift of prophecy put back in his church. This is what it is. And it's primarily, it doesn't say that teachers, somehow prophecy is the lost major gift that has to be restored so that we will know what the prophecies actually say. So that we will know what day we're living in. Because Yeshua said, when you see all these things, what things? The things in the prophecies. When you see all these things in the prophecies come to pass, he says, you will know that you're at the door. And that's, that's the major thing that prophecy does. What is the purpose of prophecy? I am sovereign, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. 
So what he has proposed, what he has made up his mind to do, he's going to do it. So the question is, how do we fit into that? And that's a choice. That's a free will choice that we have to make. It says, when the Lord Elohim, when the God Most High, the God of the heavens and the earth, decides to do something, he will first tell his servants the prophets. So, let me get this straight, if this is right. The greatest event in the plan, if we want to call it the plan of salvation, his plan, what would you deem that the greatest event in his plan would be uh, up until this time? I can't hear. Somebody be brave. His death. Okay, so now what would be the next greatest event? Redemption. His, you're talking his second coming. Right, his second coming. So that's the next greatest event, but actually it's not the next greatest event. The next greatest event is the time of trouble such as there never was since their nation. Now, during that time period, there's going to be a judgment. There will be a judgment of every living person. That's the next greatest event that we don't want to miss, and we will be involved in that. That's actually more important than his second coming, and here's why. Because if you don't get to the judgment, his second coming will be a great disappointment, because we won't make it. So the judgment actually is more important, and there's cycles in what he's doing. It goes through a cycle, and we're going to be looking at these cycles as we go. And we'll also be looking at the judgment which is set into the prophecies, and we're going to be able to see exactly when the judgment begins. We will know, and uh, it won't be any secret. He tells us, Yeshua tells us, that I've warned you about this before it happens. So one of the great reasons about prophecy is warning in advance. Now, what do we do if we're warned about something in advance? You know, your children are playing out in the road, and you warn them, go, don't go out on the street. You've warned them in advance of what could be coming. And it's to protect them. So he's done this for protection. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why he tells us. Another reason is, is now I tell you before it comes to pass, that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. So he says, you may believe that I am he when it comes to pass. So prophecy is so that... When something happens here and it's behind us, you saw it come and go or it went like his first coming, the prophecies were fulfilled. It gives you the confidence that the stuff ahead of us is going to be fulfilled also. Now here's the interesting part about end times prophecy because that prophecy hasn't happened yet. So people that are actually teaching prophecy, when people hear somebody that's teaching prophecy and they say, wow. What he said actually happened. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you see that? Logically speaking, what would you do if somebody was predicting something? What would you do when you saw it come to pass? It would kind of quicken you that, oh, maybe I better pay attention a little bit. And so this is what he's done. So Yeshua used it applying to himself. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to be crucified and I'll be rejected. That's, that's when this was said. And this is all going to happen so that when it happens, you won't be shocked. And so the same thing with prophecy that's in the future, when we understand it and we see it come to pass, we're going to know we can count on the rest of it. Because isn't it all about faith? There's a reason why Yeshua says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find what? Faith. Right? So this whole life that we have is a faith development. Is anyone growing their faith these days? Yeah, if you've been through some tests, I'm sure that that's been developing your faith. You're having to lean on him harder. You know that song, Leaning on His Everlasting Arms? Yeah, because he, he lets us get out their way on the limb, and we've, we figured, oh, we've got to lean the other way, and that's, that's why it happens. So that we can believe uh, when things happen. Also in John, same thing. This is all during the Last Supper. This is what, when he's telling them all of this, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Is this applicable to you and I? 
He has many things to say to us, but we can't bear them now. Some of the stuff that he had to tell them had to do with prof- prophetic things, and we know that, but he couldn't, they couldn't bear it now. And so he says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. That's all truth. For he shall not speak of it on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. That's prophecy. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to show us not only all truth, but show us things to come. And we're gonna, this is going to be evident as we go. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is, is basically a revelation, as we see in the book of Revelation. We're going to look at these texts in a bit. It's a, it's a revelation of our Father's plan and His Son's plan. And it's also a revelation of what else? Pardon me? adversary's plan we can't lose that everyone you know people think well prophecy is it's all his will no it's not all his will if you can get into the inside of the enemy's mind as far as his plans are concerned you got a lot better chance of winning the war and so what it is prophecy is a revelation of our father's plan and the enemy's plan and so we can we can decide which way we want to go and we can know which side we're on by following his plan. The book of Revelation tells us it is the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. Now I just I have to stop there because I've been I've been doing this but you're you've seen it now I think is I'm using the name that's in my Bible but I don't say that name. Now I used to say that name all the time but one time somebody said you know his name really wasn't Jesus and I thought well you know, maybe it wasn't. Who cares? And I started doing some homework, and what I found out was that the father actually gave Gabriel a name that was to give to Mary, and he was very specific. It wasn't just any old name. The name actually had a meaning to it, and the name Yeshua in Hebrew is Yahweh is salvation. Now, you're going to read to the New Testament. I found this very interesting is that nowhere did the Pharisees call him by his name. You ever notice that? He was called the deceiver by them. You know, he causes division and stuff. They never called him by his name. That deceiver was one of their favorites. Because his name meant something. His name meant who he was, that he was the one that brought salvation. And so when I started thinking on that, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do what it commands us to do. And I actually haven't changed back since then that was a number of years ago and and so that's where i am that's why i use this name but i i have it in my slides because it's a, a copyright thing so if i'm going to use a certain bible translation that has it i have it up in the screen but but in my own mind it's that's why i say what i say so um so just to qualify that which elohim gave to him to show his servants things that much, or must shortly come to pass or come to or sorry take place and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant john so keyword here one of the keywords is signified it so he signified it what does that mean it codified it is symbols it's dragons and it's beasts and it's horses and things like that now people say well i can't understand the book of revelation but the reason is, is because they don't work at it. It's kind of like being a, a physician. Unless you go to the school for physicians, I don't want you uh, cutting a hole in me or, or whatever, or a doctor or so on, a dentist. You want somebody that's gone to school. Well, the school is the scriptures. All we need to do is spend time in the scriptures. And we're going to see through this seminar that prophecy is actually very simple. Now, I see some younger folk here. Can anyone here count to 10? Okay, if you can count to 10, you can figure out these prophecies. That's exactly how simple they are. You just need to be familiar with the words, and, and that's really all, all they are. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to look at that concept. goes on to say, Who bore witness to the word of Elohim to the testimony, uh, and to the testimony of Yeshua, the Messiah, to all things that he saw? 
Very interesting here, the testimony of Yeshua. We're going to look at that term. We're going to determine what it is. Now, if I asked you what your testimony is, what are you thinking about? That's the story of your life, right? That's what most people think. But this is completely different. Yeshua had a personal testimony, and his testimony needs to become, become our testimony. His personal testimony, to sum it up in one sentence, he says, the devil has nothing in me. That was his personal testimony. Wouldn't that be nice to have that personal testimony? And that's all you need to tell somebody? is the devil. They're going to say, how? <laughs> how is that? Let me in on that secret. But that was his testimony. But this is actually not what it's talking about. And so this is where we need to actually do a little further investigating to find out what this means. It goes on to say, blessed or happy is he who reads. So there's a blessing in the reader. And it says, those that hear, and we know what that means, those that actually take it in. It just doesn't go in the ear and out the other. They take it in. And those that, uh, words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written in it, for the time is near. Now, to keep something means you own it now. So you own it, and that's going to set you into motion. That's what it does. So owning something actually sets you into motion to do something about it. So we have to understand what the testimony of Yeshua is. We're going to be blessed by reading it and by hearing it and actually letting it sink in. And that's going to cause us to move in a certain direction. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yeshua. Not too many places in the Bible does it actually identify our Father's last day people. But these, this is one place where it identifies and it gives two marks which they carry. One is they're obedient to him. And the other one is that they have something. And it's called the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. The same thing in verse 1. So this testimony of the Messiah goes all the way through and we need to understand what that is. So the two identifying marks is obedience. The other one is the testimony. Here it is right here in Revelation 19.10. It says, I fell at the feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Yeshua. Worship Elohim for the testimony of Yeshua is what? Right. So we've got something very interesting here. And I'm kind of a math person. I used to teach it for a number of years. And if we can make a math equation that's balanced on both sides, we can actually say that the testimony of Yeshua, when it's mentioned in the book of Revelation, the same author identifies what it is, and it's the spirit of prophecy. So apparently, the identifying mark of his people in the time of the end is obedience and prophecy. And we're going to see this as we go through. It's the law and the prophets. Have you heard that term, the law and the prophets? You can't separate them. If you have law without prophets, you don't have it. You need to have them both. Very important. And this is his word. It's not what I'm saying. It's, it's his word. So we have to get back to this concept of, of knowing what's coming and understanding what's coming. It says the dragon was enraged with the woman, went to make war with the rest of her offspring, and so on. So we have this verse again, and I just want to write another equation here. So what we have here is the commandments of our Father plus the spirit of prophecy equals the remnant. That's according to the book of Revelation. That's what it says. So we can do this again here. We want to break this term down now. The spirit, when we look at that word in a concordance, it actually has some different things because it can refer to angels, both good and bad. The spirit, that's the word that's being used. It can uh, denote our father's spirit. It can also represent the Messiah's spirit or the Holy Spirit. This is the way the word is used. So by the context, we have to determine what it is. So if it's actually called, if the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy, who is the spirit of prophecy? It's Yeshua. 
It's Christ in you. It's the Messiah in you, the hope of glory, revealing the future to you. Now, you may not have dreams, but he's going to give you, and I know this, he's going to give you insights when you hear the truth. And everyone knows this. When they hear a truth, it resonates, right? It, you, you think, yeah, that's, that feels like truth. And, of course, we have to square it with his word. But it rings in our brain, and, and that's how we determine that this is something worth listening to. So the spirit of prophecy. So the spirit, I'm going to say in this case, because it's the testimony of Yeshua, has to be referring to something about Yeshua. Now, prophecy, that word prophecy in its right use, is actually prediction. So this is why it's called the spirit of prophecy. And we're going to see this as we go through it. So this is a very important part of um, what we need to understand. And there's Bible examples when the prophet Elisha, for instance, when the king of uh, Syria was making plans to conquer the king of Israel, he would send ambushes out and the prophet in Israel would tell him, tell the king of Israel, don't go there. Make sure you get your guys out of there because you're going to get invaded. Does anyone know that story? This was the spirit of prophecy working amongst God's people so that they would know in advance. So apparently all these things were written for who? For our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. So it could be that this gift, this spiritual gift that he's going to restore amongst his people is for our best interest and for our best good so that we will be protected from those that would uh, intend to do us harm. Proverbs 29, 18 tells us where there is no revelation, different translations will use different words, where there's no revelation, and I've just stuck in here because that's what the word means, prophetic vision. It's, it's prophetic vision. Uh, if there's no revelation or vision, the people cast off restraint. They're not restrained from doing something they shouldn't do. So it has a restraining effect on us. But he says, happy is he who keeps the law. The same thing here. We have prophecy and law are always united in the word from beginning to end. Now, I don't know what you people believe. Does everyone know what a preterist is? A preterist, just in case you don't know, is somebody that thinks that most all of prophecy is all in the, all in the past. So there's that camp. There's another camp called uh, historicist or historicism, which would, would say that, well, a lot of prophecy is in the past, but there's still some prophecy in the future. Now, a futurist believes that most of it's still in the future. And, and that's okay. As long as you're in one of those camps, it's okay with everyone else to a degree. But there's someone uh, that we have that stood up on, uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 4, and he read out of it, it says, he found in the writings in the prophet, and he said, he talked about what he would do. He would heal the sick, the blame would walk, and so on. Are you guys familiar with that in Luke chapter 4? And everything was good. I get the picture that they're cheering him on, but he said something. And when he said this, whoops, let's go back here. When he said this, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's when he got into trouble. Because that's actually called presentism. You don't hear that word because it's not really understood. But what it means is prophecy is being fulfilled before your very eyes and you're not even aware of it for the most part. When the disciples were warned by Yeshua that he was going to die and be crucified and raised on the third day, when he was crucified, that whole dialogue left them and they ran. If, you, if they actually believed that he would be raised on the third day and take care of business, why would they run? But it was like they never even heard it. And that's what it's like with the prophets. We have been warned. It's all written down what's going to happen. We just got to read it. But it's almost like he's not even told us why, because we don't focus on it. We don't hear it when it's spoken. So 
part of this seminar is to get us to the place where we can know for sure that prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. And we think of things like possibly global warming. I don't know how you look at that, but people think, well, that's part of prophecy. And it is part of prophecy, actually. It's going to warm up. It's going to get real hot. Um, but it's not for all the causes that they're thinking about. There's other reasons for it and so on. And, and I talk to people, I've talked to people for years about Brexit. Brexit has to happen. There's no way. It cannot, these prophecies cannot be fulfilled without Brexit happening. Brexit is now happening. And what's going to happen here is the United States and Great Britain, the United Kingdom, they're going to get a lot closer. Are they close now? Absolutely they are. They have been for many years. But now the, the door is open for them to bond uh, a lot closer together, and they're going to have to for what the world is facing. They're going to have to. There's one thing I've found, I don't know about you, but truth is kind of hard to find, and you're not going to find it on Main Street. You're going to have to take an exit. It's just not found uh, right in front of us on the main roads. And it goes through with the books of Daniel and Revelation as well. They've been applied. People have tried to figure them out for so many years, and people have just given up. Uh, but we're told the reason for this. Now, what we're going to go through is an iceberg sort of scenario where we're going to have to meet the future head on. We're going to have to meet the icebergs that we're facing. But what we're going to do actually is we're just going to cover what we, a lot of what we can't get really down into for the sake of time. So we're going to give you a big picture of this thing. But there's always more information, and I find that myself. You will never exhaust his word with uh, trying to find information. The sun is about to set on this age. So there's, there's ages, there's, there's cycles in this plan. There's, you know, the flood came and went. Abraham, a nation was born, and so on. And we have Sodom, Gomorrah. These are kind of highlights in this thing. Yeshua came. He was born. He lived his life as an example for us to follow. He died on time. He was ro rose on time, poured out his spirit on time. And we're going to see the, another great events uh, that are going to happen, that are going to happen on time as well. And we are on time for this to happen now. There is one thing that we've learned from history. And it's this, that we do not learn from history. How's that, how's that make you feel? Is that comforting? So we know what happens when we don't learn from history, right? We're going to repeat it. And that's, do you know why that is? The reason is, is because we're fallen, fallen human beings and we just go around the same treadmill. So unless we get off the treadmill and getting off the treadmill is learning that we're just going to keep going around on this thing until we get it figured out. But we need to step off of that. We need to learn that's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. We're going to go through the same cycle. Only this time, apparently, it's going to be the worst time that there ever was. And that's why we need to learn those lessons from history. But really, the, the fact of the matter is, what we really need to learn from is his story. We need to learn the lessons from his story because those are the ones we don't want to repeat. Now, these are a couple of practical lessons that we want to learn from his story. Number one, at the first coming of our Messiah, there was something that they did wrong. They did completely wrong. Israel did this completely wrong. There's no disputing this at all. They did not see this, these events of his first coming in the prophecies. They missed it completely. You know, whatever happened to the prophecy, like a lamb led to the slaughter. You guys are familiar with that one, right? They missed that. They missed all these prophecies that forecasted his first coming. His first coming as the Lamb of God. John tried to bring these, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He tried to bring them these, uh, these prophecies, but they wouldn't hear because they were waiting for what? They were waiting for a king to destroy the Romans. What are you guys waiting for? Are you waiting for a king to destroy the Romans? Yeah, we want to be careful with that one. 
Because if we're looking for that, uh, we might be looking in the wrong place. So they messed up the prophecies. Do you think that the enemy of souls that did such a good job to peep for people that should have known better, that were in possession of the oracles of the Almighty, do you think there's a possibility because he did so well that he would try that again? Just, just wondering. Absolutely, he's going to do it again. I submit to you that the prophecies are not being read correctly. And you might say at the end of this uh, presentation is, yeah, <laughs> that was you. But the fact is that the enemy did such a good job. He's going to do this again. There is no question. And I see this all the time. The other thing where they went wrong is they didn't see him in the sanctuary. Behold the Lamb of God. So the Lamb of God, when he was, when he was being nailed up on the cross, what were they doing? For the most part, what were the, the believers doing in that time? They were running back to their house because they had to sacrifice their Passover lamb. When the real Passover lamb was being sacrificed, they left that and went over here and did what they want to do. So this is what they missed the Lamb of God right before their very eyes. They missed, there's more than the Lamb of God. There's the whole sanctuary service. And I know some of you are probably studying into the sanctuary service, but the sanctuary service had appointed times. You guys are familiar with the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and Pentecost, and so on. The, the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. You guys are familiar with that, right? So his people had these things, but they missed what they were pointing to. Had they known that, where Paul tells us that Yeshua, our Passover, in Corinthians chapter 5, he says, Yeshua, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. You see, that's what they missed. They didn't see him in these types and these fulfillments. When they waved the wave sheaf barley, that represented the first fruits. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Yeshua was the first fruits of those that slept. So there's all these types that we need to know. And the types at the end will fall in the, the sanctuary calendar. And this is, this is what I began to understand a number of years ago, is as I was studying the prophecies, I thought, wait a minute, if the festival calendar is prophetic, I should be able to blend it with the prophecies. Does that make sense? And so when I started to do that, I could actually put timings on some of the events because, wow, that was the Feast of Pentecost. Oh, that's the resurrection, and so on. And you could tell uh, these events in the prophecies. So they missed him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world because they did not see him in that type of the sanctuary type and, and time. So if we do not learn the lessons of history or his story, we are doomed to repeat them, and we don't want to do that. So what does he tell us uh, uh, the book here, Habakkuk tells us that then Jehovah answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. You know, the hardest thing that we do is waiting. Is anyone comfortable when they're waiting? They're in a waiting room at the hospital or whatever. It's just a pain, isn't it? And so the hardest thing for us to do is wait. You know, I've heard this term slower than the second coming. Do you guys use that term down here? <laughs> yeah. It's a waiting thing. And so what our Father's trying to tell us is just hang on. What I have said in the past is going to come. And the instruction to the prophet is make this thing as plain as you can so that when somebody reads it, they will run. In other words, it will set people in motion. And that's what I'm going to try and do is set you in motion. Now, what's going on here? We go back to Ezekiel and we see something very interesting. It says, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring a sword upon the land and the people of the land take, take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, 
when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning shall save his life. Now, I would just like to emphasize that last statement there, that he will save his life. Is that his eternal life that's talking about here? Not necessarily. It's your life that you have here and now. So part of prophecy and part of this knowing what's coming is so that we can save our lives. And uh, that's very important because if we don't take the warning, we may not save our lives. And our Father is interested in the life that he has given us and he wants us to take care of it in all different ways. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people do not or are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. So ultimately it's your fault that you don't take warning. But it also says, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So now we have two guilty people. So if the watchman, and that's the prophecies, the prophecies are written so that we can take warning. So the prophets, it's, it's not his responsibility. His responsibility is just to get the message to the people, and it's up to them. So we're going to be reading what the prophets wrote about the time that we're living in so that we are without excuse. Does anyone want to be without excuse? I want to be able to say at the judgment, if I'm lost, because I don't, I don't believe that this idea that once saved, always saved. I don't know where you are, but that's where I am at my walk. I actually have the freedom to choose right up until the end. So I would like to be able to say, if, if on that day that I'm lost, I would like to be able to say, you know what? I have to take the blame for this. I can't blame it on anyone else. And ultimately, we're not going to be able to blame our loss of salvation on anyone else. It's everyone's here, my own included. It's every one of us' responsibility to take ownership for your eternal life. We get that, right? We get that. Sure we do. What does it say in Proverbs? It says, wise people see trouble coming and get, get out of its way, but fools go straight into it and suffer loss. It's just a proverb from the wisest man other than Yeshua. Uh, the wisest man says that wise people get out of trouble, uh, get out of the way of trouble when it's coming. They get prepared for it so they don't get T-boned at the intersection. They can actually see that guy coming that no one else sees because they have that forewarning uh, with prophecy. Of this salvation, the, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come so this is interesting too. A lot of people think that, you know, the prophets just walked out into the woods and they had this vision. And then they had all the future revealed to them. They went home and wrote it down. Actually, the prophets, it was quite different. They studied the prophets that went before them. And then further insight was given to them. And that's what they wrote down. That's how it worked. So there has to be that thirsting, that hungering, is what does this mean? And they, they inquired, they asked questions, they searched carefully. So I'm just wondering, in my brain, I'm thinking that how am I going to know what's coming unless I inquire? That means ask questions. What's coming? And I search carefully. Well, does that make sense to you? So if we're not searching the prophet's writings carefully, we're not going to know. We won't know. And that's why it says that they will be caught unawares. But we're told that the wise should not be caught unawares. Why? Because it's been written down. We don't need to be taken off guard. It says that the prophets were searching what? Or what matter of time the spirit of Yeshua, was, which, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. So we have the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Two separate things. The sufferings of the Messiah was when? That was the first coming. What are the glories that follow that? That's the glories at his second coming. So the prophets wrote about the sufferings of the Messiah 
and they wrote about the glories. And you can actually find prophecies where you see the sufferings and you see the glory in the next text. They didn't seem to write, well, um, the sufferings are here, and 2,000 later, that's here where we're going to get the glories. Can you think of a reason why that's not written in there like that? Because of our human nature, maybe? Because we wouldn't do anything if we thought that something was 2,000 years away? And so in the prophecies, the prophets actually were on a need-to-know basis. They needed to know what was coming. And they needed to know the end of the story because that gave them hope. So our father was very wise in this. He couched the end of the story within the prophecies so that they would always have hope. But he never revealed the time. There's only a few instances where he revealed the time. And we're told, as we're going to see, that the book of Daniel would not be unsealed until the time of the end. So if we believe we're in that time, then it might be time to start looking at this book very carefully to see what it says. To them it was revealed, not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel uh, to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, the things which angels desire to look into. I never really thought of this before until I really started taking this text apart is even the angels are on a need-to-know basis. Does that make you feel better? So we're in the same camp. So our Father only reveals to them what they need to know. They're actually operating on faith. Have you thought of that before? The angels are actually operating and they're being obedient on faith. Just like us. Just like us. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, he says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. I used to read that and read that and read that. What in the world does that mean? Well, here's my best guess. A guy like me or somebody else prophesies in part. I'm telling you my best, my study, the things that I've learned from the prophets, from the writings of the prophets, and that's what I'm presenting to you. But I see through a glass darkly. I'm doing my best to figure out what this means. But it says, he goes on to say, but when that is imperfect. So when the prophecy is actually fulfilled to the letter of the word, then that prophesying that was done in part, that you couldn't see exactly what was going on, will be made known and be clear. So that which was in part will pass away, and now we have the reality. Does that make sense? And that's the way the prophets did it. They prophesied in part. They didn't have all the pieces. It's kind of like a puzzle. They didn't have all the pieces, and they were working with the pieces they had. But when another prophet came along, he gave some help in this. In Peter, he goes on to say, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. And he's talking about the first coming. All those things, prophecies about the first coming. He says that was all fulfilled. We saw that. We handled the Son of God. He says, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. According to the words of Yeshua, there has never been a darker place that we are about to enter. You understand that? So that tells me, when I take this understanding of what Peter is trying to say, he says, it's a light that shines in a dark place. Have you ever been in a real dark place? I want to tell you about a real dark place. I was 12 miles off the shore of Vancouver Island. You guys know where that is? I showed you a picture. It's a, quite a large island off of the west coast, 12 miles off. We were in a store, storm unlike, has anyone seen the, the movie The Perfect Storm? Yeah, I can, I can totally relate to that movie. We were out in a commercial fishing boat, and our captain decided to go on the outside of Vancouver Island, which was an all-night and all-the-next-day uh, jaunt around in good conditions. And so we had to come up, and the reason why we didn't go down on the inside channel, which would have been the smart way to go, but the tides would run, and it would be quicker on a normal day. It would be quicker to go on the outside. Well, we went out, and we heard there was going to be a storm coming, and a bunch of other boats uh, uh, went out too because they wanted to beat the beat the rush, get there a little early. But the storm hit. There was five people on this boat. It was a 60-foot 
um, seine boat. That's the huge nets that they let out the back. And the storm was so bad, I was not a seasoned fisherman. It was my first year out, but it was at the end of the year, so I learned a few things. Everyone on the boat, all four of the crew members, were so sick they couldn't even stand up. And I'm out in the middle of the Pacific, nothing between me and Japan. And I'm in, this, in these waves where the boat, all, my, my direction was keep the bow into the waves and keep the thrall on. That was, that was my instruction. And that's what, that's what I had to do. And I'll tell you, I was so scared. I couldn't get sick. Now get this picture. You're going down and you go into these waves and you actually start to turn into a submarine when you get to the bottom. And the water comes right over the wheelhouse and it's crashing right over. That's when I started to relate to that movie. I thought, oh man, I know what these guys are freaking out because it's scary out there. And there's no street lights. No street lights that far out. I had one spotlight that pointed that direction, and it was into the waves. I went, uh, I did that for a few hours. All I had was the radar screen, and I was instructed, keep the boat right here and keep the land over here because there's rings. Anyone that's familiar with radar, and you can tell this ring, is, I think it was five miles or whatever, we had it dialed in, and I had to keep so many rings out. And just and I hammered all night. Every once in a while, somebody would get up. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing. And so I had a guy take over. About halfway through, I had a guy take the wheelhouse. I went down into the bottom of the boat just to check, make sure everything's staying together. Because the thing is, it feels like it's, it's an old, the boat was about 80 years old, old wood fishing boat. And I wanted to go down there and just make sure everything's okay. And so I went down there and looking at the motor, make sure everything's working fine. And I dropped to my knees and I said, God, if you have a plan for me, you're going to have to get me out of this mess. Because I figured there's no way I'm coming out. And so that was the day when I turned it around. That was in 1984. And I have purpose in my heart to follow him. And we all need to do that. That's just something that happened to me. We've all got experiences. But it's those experiences, those dark place. Has anyone in, been in a dark place? Those dark place experiences are calculated by our Heavenly Father to get us to our knees. That's what they're for. That's what he allows them for. And I thank him for that. Was I thanking him during? <laughs> when I got off the boat the next day, when I got off the boat, we made it around. Uh, we ran out of gas. We had to get towed because we hammered all night and we used up our, all our fuel. It was, it was a disaster. Anyways, I got off the boat and I got off onto the wharf, this big wharf, and I said, if I never set my foot on another fishing boat, that'll be just fine <laughs> with me. Um, but I, I praise him for that. It's nice to look back on that. I never want to do that again. What we're going to do here, this is something that I found a while ago was brought to my attention just the other week um, by a good friend of mine, Darren, who is in the audience tonight. He said, didn't Sir Isaac Newton say something about this? He says, um, he says, about the time of the end, and whether he's a prophet, it's irrelevant. He made a statement. He is a pretty smart guy. He said, a body of men will, raise up, will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. Now, let me give you the framework. Let me give you the context. Even in his time, back in the 1600s, people were making all these predictions about the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. This is not a new thing. And he was getting so tired of it. He said, look, you guys, 
you're, you're spiritualizing all this away. You know, we see something like a burning mountain coming down out of the air. Does anyone read that in the book of Revelation? It goes into the sea and kills all this stuff. They were spiritualizing all this stuff away because they couldn't understand how that could happen. But he says at the time of the end, he says, you know, we got to start reading it for what it says. Just read it for what it says. If we can make a literal application, that's the safest. Spiritual application. So this idea that there's multi-levels of scripture, what it is really, that concept, while it's true to a degree, what it is is a license to come up with all kinds of options about what a scripture could mean. Are you with me? And so we've got to be really careful with that. The best way to tackle scripture is just, what does it say? Let's entertain what it says. And that's what I believe he's saying. Let's just take the word for what it says. Now, according to the words of Yeshua, he said, then he said to them, therefore, every scribe, every scribe, that would be someone that records scripture, someone that would teach scripture, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So let's just break that down, that simplicity of what he's trying to say. He says, everyone that's instructed in the word, in this word, will bring things out of here that are new and old. So what should that tell us? Is that we should expect to hear new things if someone is actually being led by the Spirit. Is that right? Is that what it says? Now I know, I know some people, and I know that's not you guys here because you're here for a reason. But I know people that if a new thought entered their mind, it would die of loneliness because it would be the only one there. And they just recoil. They recoil from this idea of a new thought because it doesn't fit in their box. It doesn't fit in their box. And we all need to come to grips with that is that Yeshua said, when he, the spirit of truth is coming, he'll lead you and guide you. It's a process. If there's anyone here or anyone that you come in contact with that claims they have all the truth, I would say put on your runners and get out of there as quick as you can. Because truth is a process. It's a destination. We're going to that destination. And he says that you will know the truth. Yeshua says you will know the truth and the truth will do what for you? It will set you free. So I just took that for what it says and I says, I need as much truth as I can get. Because what I really need is freedom. I need freedom. And that's what he's trying to do. And that's what the truth does. It sets us free from things that hold us back. He tells us a little parable in Luke chapter 5. He talks about... Uh, sewing a piece of cloth on an old piece of cloth. You guys are familiar with that. And then he gets into, and he says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. Now, I don't think he's trying to teach us how to put stuff into flasks and stuff. I, I don't think that. He's telling us something that it's got, that we can learn from. So what would new wine be? It's information. It's new information. It's pure teaching is what it is. We can see in the book of Revelation that there's a harlot, and she's got a golden cup. And it says it's full of abominations. It's the, called the wine of Babylon that's full of abominations. Well, if our father gives us new wine, what's called new wine, this is pure. This is the pure teachings of the word. And he says, if you put the pure teachings of the word or the real meanings of the word into old wineskins, what are wineskins? They're containers. What does our Father pour into us? It's truth. And the truth is to have an effect. But if he gives new truth or pure truth into someone that's old, which would mean the old man is reigning, there's an explosion. Have you ever done that to try and give a precious truth to somebody and they just totally reject it and they actually get mad and, and so on? This is what he was saying here. Don't do it. He's actually warning us not to do it. And he does this another way at another time when he says something about don't give your pearls to the swine, swine and why not? 
They will trample the, the pearls, but they won't only trample the pearls. They're looking for you when they're done, and they will trample you. So he's instructed us to be careful about the way you handle truth, uh, because you could run into some problems if you don't. So what he says is the uh, wineskins will be ruined, the truth will be lost, the wine will be lost. Uh, when, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. In other words, in order for us to accept new things that are truth, we have to be recreated. We have to be, as it were, born again. We have to be that new flask so he can put new wine in. If we're so bent on, on accepting old, when you put the new in it, it, it causes an explosion. So he said, and this is, I'm talking to me now, if I want to know what the truth is for today, if, if our Father has a truth for today, I have to be converted. I have to, every day, I'm born again. We have to have this born again experience every day. It's not a once time fits all. It's an everyday experience. Father, I want to give myself to you. If you have something to show me today, I want it. I want it. But be careful what you pray for. Uh, we've heard that before. So he goes on to say, but the new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved, and no one having drunk an old wine immediately desires the new, for he says the old is better. Very interesting. So how many people accept new teaching? This says no one. A thinking person will not accept something new immediately. That's what he said. Now, you know why that is? Because he's built, and I'm talking about people that have reasoning powers now. I'm not talking about, is any reasoning power, any person that has good reasoning powers will first think something through and then make a decision. If you accept something carte blanche the first time you hear it, I would submit to you, you are not thinking. We have to study things out. We have to let the Holy Spirit convict us of something. And uh, we have to be convinced of something because we want to stick to the old. And that's a safety thing that our Father has built into our brains, is we don't accept things the first time. Now, the thing is, we have to open our minds to investigate. And that's how we're supposed to do it. He's given us that time to do this. So we're going to start looking here at signs of the end of the age. So I hope we're, we're established here that, that prophecy is extremely important for us to know where we are at in time. The best place to start with, in my mind, are the words of Yeshua. Would that be a good place to start? So the question was asked him, the signs of the end of the age. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. The question specifically was asked, as we're going to see here, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, when we look through another principle that we want to be familiar with is when we look through the New Testament and follow Yeshua around, we're going to find out a lot of things that he taught were the product of a question. A lot of the New Testament is a product of a question. So what does that tell you? If you want information, you need to do what? You need to ask the question. And that's when we're going to get the answers. We have not because we... It's that simple. It's like the law of gravity. It works every time. So we've got to be asking. It says, you will find me when? When you search for me with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. I'd, I'd really like to know what that looks like. What would that actually look like? The finding is only in the conditions when you do this. So we've got to ask, we've got to search, just like the prophets did. That's how they got the answers, and so on. And that's what we're going to do. We are asking. We are here because we want to know. It says, Then Yeshua went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. This is beautiful. So they're at, just before he was crucified, they're in at the temple, they're, they're going to be celebrating the feast. They didn't understand that he was going to die. They heard him say it, and say it, and say it, but they didn't get it. And so the question is asked, where are we going to celebrate the Passover? It was just business as usual. So he was sort of, 
he was, his mind was on different things. And you can imagine what he'd be thinking about. His mind really wasn't what their focus was on. And so they wanted to get his attention, like Yeshua. How come we don't spend more time here because this temple is pretty spectacular? Wouldn't you agree? And, and they, he sort of, he had to tell them. He says, well, guys, this thing's coming down. The whole thing is coming down. Everything that you've been taught about this place is about to change, and it's going to change radically because they are actually going to crucify me. The people in charge of this temple, they're going to kill me, and this temple is going to come down as a result of their rejection of who I am. They still didn't get it. They still didn't hear it until he was resurrected. But they wanted to bring this to attention. And so what they were doing all the time is they were standing, they were sitting around in their circles and determining something. What were they determining uh, when they were in their little circles talking amongst themselves? Who was going to be the greatest? Yeah. Somehow I think we get messed up in that again. Who's going to, instead of talking about him and his plan, we're trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest. And the, the best way that I know that I've seen is who holds the most information. Here again, we come back to the same thing. Oh, this is how it's going to be played out. Oh, no, that, that's not how it's going to be. It's going to be like this. And if you don't agree with me, then you're an outcast. You can't fellowship with us. Have, am I just, do we live up in Canada in a vacuum or is this going on down here too? It's everywhere. There is a shaking going on amongst his people unlike any other time. And, and we can expect that. This is what's going on. And the reason is it's like a, a sieve, like a sifter, a wheat sifter, is he's shaking this thing. And we want to fall through and into the container. And some people are, you know, the rough ones, they're, they're falling out. And that there's a purpose in this, and it's not very fun, but it's happening. People are taking sides and so on. What we don't understand is he's, he's this process that's going on, this coming into all knowledge of truth. So we need to cut each other slack in this and not be so hardy on each other as we're trying to figure out what the truth actually is. Because we've been in the dark a long time, and I read somewhere where it says we've inherited lies. Have you guys seen that? Yeah, there's a verse in there that says we've inherited lies. So we get this... Uh, understanding that we have, for the most part, honestly. So they're going up now. Yeshua goes ahead of them, and they're yakking, they're yakking away. And then, uh, then Yeshua says, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. This is why he wasn't preoccupied with the temple, because he knew this thing was coming down. He didn't want to draw attention to the edifice, because it was coming down. And his temple was about to be destroyed. So he goes on to say, Now as he sat, so now they climb up to the top of the Mount of Olives. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be and what sign or, or what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So here we go. There's the question. Has this time frame happened yet? The end of the age. No, we have to say no. The answer to that is no. So could he be talking about our time? So the disciples wanted to know about when he would come and the end of the age. The turning of the clock, as it were. That cycle of time would go by when he would return. So that's the question. That's the question that we should be asking. Exactly the same question. Because he honored this question. And how did he honor it? He told them what was going to happen. So if we ask the question and we listen to his words, we will be able to find out what's going to happen as well. And that's why it was recorded for our admonition. Well, it'll be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. So he goes up, it goes up specifically and says, it says they came to him privately in the last text. This tells exactly who it was. Now, it was Peter, James, John, and Andrew. What's so special about these guys? Pardon me? 
Yeah, you know, that's just the way it works, isn't it? You've probably got a close circle of friends, the ones that you can call, you got a problem, I'm going to give that guy a call. These were the inner circle. This was the Mount of Transfiguration. It was, it was John, Andrew, and Peter that were up on the Mount of Transfiguration. That was a pretty neat experience. These guys had experiences that the others didn't have. And I can just imagine the other disciples is, you guys go find out what he was talking about when he said that temple's coming down. And so these guys went privately to ask this question because they figured, well, they'd be able to get the answer because he talks in parables to us. You guys can get it straight. So they go, and this is what he says. The question was, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? This is his response. So when they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? What sign will there be when these things are about to take place? This is another question. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So when are these things about to take place? So here again, Luke records it a little differently. When are these things about to take place? In other words, I want advance warning. This is what we want. This is what we're trying to seek here. Was we want advance warning as to when these things are about to take place. So here he goes with his answer. He says, And Yeshua answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. So who is he talking about here? He's actually talking to us. Because those guys didn't live in the time of his second coming. So this admonition actually is more about us and more directed at us then it was directed at them. They thought it was directed to them, but they recorded it. And now 2020 hindsight says that 2,000 years ago, he didn't show up again, but he's talking about our time. So his admonition is to us, what he's going to say here. He says, take heed, no one deceives you. Before he tells them any of the events that are going to be happening, he says, hey, it doesn't really matter what's going to happen. Deception is the key. Four times in Matthew 24, he goes back to the concept of deception. It's the most, it's the most talked about thing in his whole discourse up there is deception. Four times he goes back there. So that tells me that that is the most important thing at the time of the end. Would you agree with that? Sure it is. So he says, take heed. Now, I need Peter, James, John, and Andrew up here. Do I have any of those here? Okay, who would, feel, who would feel they could climb this set of stairs and come up here and give me a hand for a sec? I need that cordless mic. Is somebody, could somebody grab me that cordless mic? Yeah, please. Hey, bring that cordless mic up here. That'd be one. I need four people up here. I need four people up here. It's not going to be hard. It's not a test. Okay. Who wants to do the talking? Where do you want me? No, no, not me. Well, I want you in the light. Let's get in the light here. Okay. Need one more. Pardon me? Three. Oh, we got three. No, I think he's getting ready. Yeah, we're coming. Okay, so let's just turn this because you guys got to use this. Okay. So I'll just read this. Uh, because I know what it says here, it says, take heed. So I, you guys are four, we're ta having a little discussion here, and I say, take heed that no one deceives you. I know what you want to know. You want to know all the events, so you can line them all up and get them all straight. But before we get into that, just make sure no one deceives you. And he says, the reason for many will come in my name, saying that I am he, and will deceive many. Did you guys get that? Let's do it again. I'm having a conversation with these guys, and I say, many will come in my name, saying that I am he, and will deceive many. Now, there's a problem with this text. Do you see the quotation marks around, I am the Christ? Do you see those? You do understand that the quotation marks are not inspired. It's the words that are inspired. The quotations were put in. If you read that with quotation marks, you will get the idea that this guy that's coming along here at the end of time is saying, I'm the Christ. That's the way it reads, with the quotation marks. But I submit to you, that is not what he said. And let's look at this a 
a little more closely so that we can know how good the deception is going to be. It says, And he said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. What time has drawn near? What was the question? We have to go back to the question. What is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The question is, his coming. So these people that are coming in his name, saying that I am he, they're also saying the time is drawn near. What time is drawn near? The second coming. Right? So if they were claiming to be the Messiah, they're not saying the, the time is drawn near. They're saying, it's here. I'm here. You follow? So he said that many are going to come in my name. So what does that mean? That means coming as a representative, as his authority, in his authority. So that would be a teacher that teaches in his name, that comes in his authority. Now, I used to own an electrical business, and I had a name on there, and it said Stapleton Electric on the van. And I would have people that worked for me, and they would go to jobs, and I would have a contract with these people, and they would get the job done, and I never showed up on the job. These people went in my name. Yeah, we're here, we're representing Stapleton Electric, and we're going to get the job done. And they were happy, because they had me behind it. My name was on the van. They knew if they had any problems, they could get a hold of me. So at the end, what Yeshua is actually saying is, there's many going to come in my name, saying that he is the Messiah. And we're going to read this different here in a second, just to make the point, because this is a, it's a real stumbler for us, because we're always looking at this weird. So we're going to look at this again here. So he goes on to say, they will deceive many, okay, my name. We want to look at this as well. So now let's change this a little bit. So I've taken the quotation marks out. So now it reads different. It says, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, many will be teaching in my name, saying that I am, that Yeshua is the Messiah, and those are the people that are going to deceive many. I submit to you that it's probably not likely that you're going to be deceived, I would hope, that if someone claimed to be Yeshua, I would hope not. But if somebody's teaching in his name, that's where the deception now, it even gets worse than that. And we're going to look at that uh, a little bit more here. Same thing, for the sake of time, we won't. I've removed the quotation marks here again. It reads the same way. It's his statement about people that are teaching in his name coming as a representative of him as well. And that's how we're going to see that he used the term as well. So it goes here, it says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying that I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then he goes on in another place in John, he says, I have come in my Father's name. So, was he claiming to be the Father? No. He was a representative of the Father. So he's saying again, for clarity's sake, he's saying that at the time of the end, people will be preaching in his name, they will be coming in his authority. That means they will be teaching out of his word. And they will be saying something. What was that? That Yeshua is the Messiah. And that the time of the second coming or the end of the age has drawn near. Thank you. Cool. That was easy. Yeah. No, it wasn't a test or anything. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is really important, and, and the reason is, is because of what else he said. He said, for, may, for many will say to, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done wonders in your name? Then he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness. Okay, so now he's identified these people. What name is he talking about here? What name is he talking about? The, word, the name Jesus didn't come about long after long after he was, 
he was talking about this. The only name he could have been referring to is the name that his mother gave him. So he was referring to that. So according to Yeshua's own word now, we're just trying to flesh this out. According to his own word, there will be people at the end that will be teaching in his actual name that he would have been referring to. And they are going to deceive, according to his word, many. Now, I don't know if that bothers you, but that bothers me a lot. Because the, the people that I mix with, generally, they use that name. They use the name that his mother gave him. So I'm on, you know, my radar is going full on when I'm around these people. Because people that are doing other things, I'm, I'm, they're not really in my radar because I don't spend that much time there. But I do spend a, quite a bit of time with people that use his name. He goes on to say that these people are going to claim to do all these things in his name. But he says that they're worker, workers of iniquity in another place. And it says they, they practice lawlessness. Now, this is talking about God's law. This is talking about the Father's law. You know, the Ten Commandments would be a central theme in that, but there's other things that are involved. But these are people that do that. I'm finding that the people that use his name, the name of Yeshua, they're really good at practicing the law. You follow what I'm saying? They claim to be followers of the law. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road, in my mind. Is there were teachers down at the temple that taught in the name of Jehovah. They taught in that name. If they walked by you, you would almost want to bow to them because of their authority and their apparent righteousness. Are you getting where I'm going with this? So he said, at the end of time... There would be those that would claim to teach in, not in the name of Yahweh, Yahweh necessarily, but in the name of Yeshua. That means they've accepted the Messiah. There would be teachers that have accepted the Messiah, have gone back to the old ways, the ways that we're called to do, have gone back to be obedient because they've learned that lesson. We lost the garden because of disobedience. And in the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, verse 14, it says, Here are they that keep the commandments, and here are they that have a right to the tree of life, because they've learned that lesson. So the commandments are pretty important. Uh, but the idea is, is at the end, the ones that deceive many are keeping the commandments, at least outwardly, and they're teaching in his name. Now, I don't know what that does to you, but when I said that to somebody, he said, that's getting complicated. That's because it's such a good deception. What I'm trying to say here is that I qualify, and don't, please don't walk out yet. I qualify in all counts to be a deceiver, according to Yeshua. I teach in his name. I teach the law and the prophets. And I teach that the second coming is at hand. So that means, in my mind, I need to be very wary of people. I need to question them. It doesn't mean I can't trust them. It's just I've got to test it. I've got to test what they're saying. Because the ones that do all those three things, according to Yeshua, are going to deceive many. This is something that we need to understand. Because some people think that they get to a certain place and they've arrived. They haven't, got, they haven't arrived at all. It's not over until it's over. Ecclesiastes tells us that uh, this is Solomon again. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole. This is uh, man's duty or man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So I have this idea that the people that he's talking about are much the same as the Pharisees downtown Jerusalem, where it, in all intents and purposes, they looked holy, primarily because of the outward acts. But in the heart, they were like dead man's bones. And apparently, we didn't learn the lesson the first time, and we're going to have to go through that again. So the encouragement, what I would like to encourage, is that we have to test everything. Everything. 
And there's, there's a story in 1 Kings. Does anyone remember a story uh, about Ahab and Jehoshaphat, two kings in ancient Israel? There's a story where Ahab and Jehoshaphat, their, their son and daughter, had married and they wanted to reunite the kingdom. And they did it. They were trying to do it through marriage and they thought, you know, this would build relationships. And it did build relationships. Ahab um, got on his cell phone one day and he called uh, Jehoshaphat up and he says, hey, come on up. We've got to have a party. So they came up and he said, this is really what I want to do. You know, the king of Syria, that land that he has, he says, I want it back. It's actually ours. It's Israel's. And he says, uh, will your men and will you unite with our men and can we take this land? And Jehoshaphat, he said, uh, well, uh, I will. My men are your men and uh, we can unite on this. But he says, I got a question for you. Have you sought Jehovah on this? And uh, he's, then he called all of his prophets, 400 of his prophets. And they told uh, Ahab to go up and take the land. He'll be victorious and so on. And then uh, Jehoshaphat said, isn't there a prophet of Jehovah here? He read right through it. Isn't there a prophet of Jehovah here? And he said, yeah, there is a prophet, but he doesn't ever have anything to say that's good about me. So we don't usually call on him. He, he doesn't get the call. So uh, he says, how could you say such a thing? He says, I want to talk to him. That's the guy I want to talk to. And so while, he was, while the messenger was gone, the false prophets got into the, the, into the picture. It says, now Zedekiah, the son of Chenaniah, had uh, made horns of iron for himself. And he said, thus says Jehovah. You can't miss this now. Every time where it says capital L-O-R-D, that's the name. So these, these guys were preaching in the name. This is the point of this thing. They are teaching in the name of the Almighty. He says, uh, thus says Jehovah, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. Nice story. Sounds good. Let's do it. Goes on to say, and all the prophets prophesied so. so all in harmony. Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for Jehovah will deliver it into the king's hand. So this goes back to what we're saying, is this is nothing new. It's nothing new to be teaching in the name of the father or his son and bringing deception. This is not something that's new. This has been going on for a long, long time. He said this is going to happen at the end as well. So he goes on to say, Then the messenger had gone to call Melchiah, Micaiah. And he spoke to him saying, listen now the words of the prophets with one accord. So he gives him a little briefing on what's going on because why are we leaving here? He says, all the prophets are saying this. So I want you to say the same thing to the king because they're all in one accord. He says, please let your word be like one of the word of them, the prophets, the false prophets, and speak encouragement. Now they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Very interesting concept here. The prophets were of, the false prophets were of one accord. They were all saying the same thing. Now I want to put some, try and put some flesh on this one as well. There was a, a very popular speaker in the 1980s and I think even into the 90s and so on. And he got caught doing some things he shouldn't do, ended up in jail. They interviewed him in jail and they asked him lots of questions. I believe he wrote a book and so on about his experience. And he's reconverted now. Wonderful. Anyways, this is what's happened. And one of the questions they asked him, how did you get so popular? And he said, well, actually, I sought out the best teachers and the most prosperous teachers of the Bible and I just preached what they preached. This is a lesson that we got to learn. I submit to you that a lot of teachers are tied onto somebody's tail and they're actually just going around and around and around in the same circle. Now that's a pretty high and mighty thing to say. 
But when we really examine this, we can actually see it. And I'm not going to name names. This is a challenge. If anyone's a teacher out there, this is a challenge to both me and to you. Don't follow someone. Follow him. Very important. Don't repeat what somebody else is thinking. Don't do it. Our Father wants us to be independent thinkers, not reflectors of what other men are thinking. We can't do it. It's dangerous. And he's told us why. Because the prophets, or the false prophets, are just repeating what everyone else is saying. That's what's going on. And... Uh, I'm not exempt. I have to watch myself. Why am I teaching something? It's because that guy's popular, and if I get on his train, then I'll get a drawing and, and all this stuff, and I'll make lots of money because I'm going to be popular, and people lose. This is what it's about. This is what it's about. It's about survival in this thing. It's a very dangerous thing when someone gets up there and starts proclaiming the word of Jehovah. It says, then Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of Jehovah. So he jumps in the scene. He arrives on the scene after all this whole blue, call it whatever you want, all this demonstration that the king Ahab is going to be victorious and come on, Joseph, come on up for, and we're going to defeat this guy. He says, I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. Now, have you heard Yeshua say something about the right and the left? Had to do with sheep and goats? This says all the host of heaven. Do you know the principalities of darkness are included in this? This is how it works. This is what we need to understand. This concept. And the disciples understood this concept. He said, he saw this. So the true prophet says, I saw something up there that happened. And I'm going to tell you what happened. He goes on to say, and Jehovah said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, the right, and one spoke in that manner. When you say that term, somebody said this and somebody said that. That's opposition. That's that. Those guys are saying this. These guys are saying this. So the question is asked, who's going to go up? So what's the answer? It says, then a spirit came forward. doesn't say whether it's good or bad. It just says a spirit came forward and stood before Jehovah. I'll do it. I'll do it. What are you going to do? Well, let's tell everyone. The Lord said to him, Jehovah said to him, in what way? How are you going to persuade him? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit. I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And Jehovah said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Now, this kind of bothers me a little bit. Because I want to know whose side the spirit was on. Is it possible for God to lie? We're told that. It is impossible for him to lie. We already know that. So would he have one of his elect, his elect angels, go out and lie to someone to do his dirty work? Is that possible? No. So this is, this is evil. This is, the, this is kind of like in the book of Job, where Satan walks into this gathering, this appointed gathering, and our father says, well, tell everyone what you've been up to. It was a revelation. Did the father need to know what Satan was up to? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Job chapter 1, chapter 2, when the sons of God came, and they presented themselves, and it says, Satan came also, and he quizzed him on what he was doing. So these, this evil at some point, has access to these, these meetings. This is another meeting, just like that. So the spirit, this evil spirit comes up. He says, I'll do it. I'll be a lying spirit. And, and the father says, you will. But that wasn't what he wanted. It was a prophecy that you'll go and you will do this because I know what Ahab is going to do. He's going to listen to you. 
So he says, go. You go. So that goes out, and it says, in John, it's very interesting. He says, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Context now. This is what it has to be talking about. But test the spirits, whether they are of our Father, because many false prophets. You see that? The spirits and the false prophets work together. Now, we've got a real problem here down at the end of time. We've got a lot of sincere people that are wrong because they've accepted errors. And the way they've accepted errors is they're listening to the wrong spirit. These are teachers. These are teachers. They're listening to the wrong spirit. They're not weighing the evidence properly for whatever reason. Yeshua's own words in John chapter 10, he says, My sheep hear my voice. They won't follow another shepherd. They know that. They won't follow it. How the question that we have to ask is, how do we know we're listening to the right spirit? Because evidently, the false prophets don't. The rest of that story with Ahab, it was a disaster. Ahab was slaughtered on the hill. He never made it back. And the people were, were, it was just a total disaster. This is what will be the end of those that are listening to the wrong spirit. And this is a challenge, this challenges me and it, challenge, it should challenge all of us. Because we need to know where these voices are coming from. Now there's a principle when we see this. We see a true prophet and we see a false prophet. And I submit that they lie close together. And if you look down the railroad track, the tracks appear to meet. And this is what the false prophet and the true prophet, they are saying much the same thing, but they, those tracks never meet. This is how good the deceptions are going to be. It's going to look like we might be saying the same thing, but we're not. Clearly we are not. And they are, they are not going to meet. Psalms tells us he makes his angels, that's the righteous angels, spirits, his ministers of flame of fire. Another place in Hebrews it tells us they are the angels speaking about are not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit uh, salvation. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to, to battle to the great day of God Almighty. Thessalonians tells us, and we're going we're gonna to wind up here shortly because we've got to uh, get out of the hall here for another event. We just want to kind of finish up on this point so that we understand clearly. It says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the power and working of Satan and all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. See, this was the problem with Ahab. He didn't want the truth. That's why he never called the true prophet, because he didn't want the truth, because he liked the wages of unrighteousness. Goes on to say in Thessalonians, And for this reason, the Father will send strong delusion. That's the evil. He will allow them to go, and convince us of things that aren't true. Does anyone here want to be convinced of something that's not true? We have to have a love of the truth no matter the cost. No matter the cost. God will send them strong delusion that they would believe the lie that they all may be condemned who do not uh, believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, where it says the lie, some translation says a lie, but it's actually the lie. Do you know what the lie is? The lie is the same lie that was told in the garden, is that you can have eternal life and you can live in sin at the same time. That's the lie that the devil has perpetrated all the way through. You can have the kingdom and have your sin too. No, no, there has to be a separation of those two things. We can't have it. We can't have it both ways. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never, never stumble, and so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Yeshua the Messiah. 
So an abundant entrance, and that's what we want, is this abundant entrance. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in present truth. Now here's the slide that we want to end on tonight. And I want to encourage all of us, is that I don't know where you are in the maze. I would like to be able to say, put an X there and say, I am here. And if I just go this way, but none of us know exactly where we are in the maze. We are, in, we are still in the maze. And we're going to have to go down some roads and come back. And go down a different road and come back. This is, what it, this is really what it's all about. And so we need to keep searching. The very first event, the very first event that Yeshua spoke about, that we would know where we are in the maze to get out the other side, it says... You will hear of wars, of rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end has not come. Now, I don't know about you, but I was told, well, they've had wars and rumors of wars ever since I can remember. Has anyone heard that before? This war that Yeshua is actually referring to, it is the war. It's the war that brings on the time of the end. It also says in Luke, a little different, it says you will hear of wars and commotions. Do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. I want to look at this word commotions. The word commotion means instability. Has anyone seen any worldwide instability at this time? It is everywhere. Every country is going through turmoil. It's a state of the world. It's unrest. It's strife everywhere. Even in, in America, it, it's becoming very strife. So there's rumors of wars. There's strife. It goes on to say that nation will rise against nation for, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquake in various places. So this idea that at the beginning, he says, there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes that will be in connection to the war. Now, what is that saying? That is saying that the famines are a result of the war. And we know that World War III could bring on, if there was a World War III, could bring on famines and pestilence. Anyone watching the news lately? This is what's going on with this little virus that's happening. This is just the beginning. This is the beginning when it's going to get way worse than that. He says here, all these things are the beginning of birth pains. In chapter 66, if you have a pen, just jot this down. In chapter 66, it talks about a woman delivering her children. That deliverance, there's birth pains that she goes through. Our father is trying to deliver his people, but there's birth pains that we are going to have to go through. And this is what he's warning him. It says, then they will deliver you up to affliction and kill you, and you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betrayed one another, and will hate one another, and many false prophets. Here again, deception, and will deceive many. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold, but he who endures, he who endures to the end, shall be saved. So there's endurance. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the land and as, a, as a witness to all nations, all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Very interesting where Yeshua was at this time. He was looking down the Mount of Olives right into the temple. This is quite possibly what he was looking at, talking about this holy place. The prophets actually were told, Daniel was told by Yeshua himself, his own words, said, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. The question to the disciples is, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Yeshua told Daniel to shut up the book and seal it until the end of the age, and at that time, he says, many will study it. Many will go to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. This is what this seminar is going to try and do very clearly, is to reveal to us exactly what's going to happen 
in the next few years. What's going to happen in the next two years, and so on. So I would, I want to encourage everyone to come back, bring a, a friend, because we're going to be looking at the specific war next time that will show us clearly exactly what the news is talking about with this sword coming on the land. There's going to be a war of two great civilizations, the West and Islam. We are about to square off, and that is going to take us into the time of the end. That's the entry point. So at that, um, we'll just leave it at that point for now. We'll let you go here, and uh, let's have a word of prayer before we all part. Father in heaven, we pray that you be with us. We ask that you bless us. And Father, we, we ask that you would reveal to us uh, not only what is truth, but how we deal with it. Uh, that's really what we need to know, how we can apply these things. Pray you be with us, be with each person here. Father, we ask these things in the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. All right.